Thank you for exalting our Lord in music. We want to exalt our Lord through Scripture, and I want you to find with me Luke chapter 17 as we look at a challenging passage of Scripture as we continue our journey through Luke. This passage is so rich, so dense that I almost broke it up into two sermons, but it's Luke chapter 17. We'll begin in verse 1. The overarching theme of the passage is found in verse 3. Jesus said, be on your guard. Now, when Tara and I lived in northeast Missouri, you had to be on your guard for deer. There were two places, at least in the county, where you knew when dusk arrived, deer would be there. And if you were a local, you knew to be on your guard when you drove through one of those places. So, one foggy November night, I come to the top of a hill on a winding river road, Highway 79, if anyone's ever been on that. And I know beyond any shadow of a doubt that at the bottom of the hill, there are going to be deer. So I slow down to about 40, crest the hill, and sure enough, they're having a party in the middle of the road. Now I tapped the brakes, but it hadn't rained in some time, and I started sliding. So I'm tapping my brakes, and I'm slowly sliding, and I'm honking my horn, and I'm flashing my lights. Not that that probably did any good. And most of the deer got the idea. One genius just stood there. I kid you not, I am almost looking this deer in the eye. I am going so slow, but I can't get stopped. Then I could hear his hooves scuffling on the pavement as he finally realized he was in the middle of the road, and there was a 94 Plymouth minivan coming at him. I bumped him ever so slightly. He scampered off in the cornfield off to the east toward the river, and I said, good, I hope it hurt. And I looked, and I had just one little part of my grill cracked, which shows how slightly I touched him. But there's a reason I tell that story in so much detail. Had I not been on my guard, going into an area where there were known perils, I could have run headlong into that whole group of deer and possibly experienced serious injury. In a similar way, Jesus is teaching us to be on our guard as we walk through this life because there are perils that we face, but if we are on guard, if we are watchful, there are also blessings we will receive. And this morning, he gives us three clear reasons why we should be on guard. So read with me, beginning in verse 1. He said to his disciples, Offenses will certainly come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to our Lord, increase our faith. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, the Lord said, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Now, there are three reasons we need to be on our guard. Look at verse 1. The first reason is the dreadful possibility of making someone stumble. Look at it again. He said to his disciples, offenses, or a different translation may say stumbling blocks. Offenses or stumbling blocks will certainly come. Remember that there is a large crowd listening. There are Pharisees and scribes and sinners and followers. But verse 1 is clear and even a little bit ominous. This is directed at his disciples. So this has direct implication for you and I. And he said to his disciples, offenses or stumbling blocks will certainly come. Now we get the word scandal from that word for offense. It referred to a trap for birds that one would set using a box and a stick. You must always be on your guard because stumbling blocks will come, and the danger is that we will trip over one of those and become a stumbling block ourselves. 
So we guard, we watch over our soul. In our county, you knew of the problem places, but the entire county was teeming with deer. You could run into one at any time, or if you've ever had an accident with a deer, you know sometimes they run into you. So you had to be on guard. Now there are three common enemies that every one of us face. Every one of us need to be on guard against these three enemies. What are they? Our infernal enemy, it, the devil. Our external enemy, the world. And our internal enemy, the flesh. The world, the flesh, and the devil form an unholy trinity that can trip us up at any moment. Our enemies are powerful. Our temptations are great, but God is greater. My concern is that His power is largely untapped and that we are stumbling over pebbles. Now, I ask you this morning, for the next few moments, to give me permission to speak to you as one who Hebrews says has to keep watch over your soul. The Bible clearly teaches that a church is to pray together. We have prayer meetings once a month. I know some of you miss for good reasons. I miss one myself not too long ago. But there's ultimately a reason that prayer meetings are absent that most believers miss them. Deep down inside, there's no need in your life you think you can't meet. There's no desperation for anything. A lost soul? A besetting sin? A person in need? A country embracing perversion? There's a spirit of indifference and independence and self-sufficiency. Conversely, simple obedience yields fruitful results. Recently, one of our members stood up at the start of a prayer meeting and confessed a sin. And then we had one of the best prayer meetings we've had in quite a while. Why? Simple obedience. The Bible says, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. God is faithful to respond to His Word. Simple obedience yields fruitful results. Now, I may be saying this on the wrong Sunday, but some of you are not faithful to the weekly worship gathering. The Lord's Day was once such a priority that the entire nation shut down. You couldn't go shopping. You couldn't buy alcohol. You couldn't go to a movie. It was even hard to find gasoline. Now the Lord's Day isn't even a top priority among those who name Christ. Dear ones, we're tripping over pebbles. I looked at our spiritual growth conference ticket sales. We have about 100 from West Haven. That ought to be at least 175. We've assembled five of the finest preachers in America. Jared Wilson is sought globally, not regionally, globally. He's been at two conferences in Australia this summer. Maybe you'll like his preaching, maybe you won't. But look at his website, he's full. Dr. Yates and Dr. Matz have both stood behind this pulpit. They're two of the finest expositors you will ever hear. David McAlpin preached for me here after my transplant. I served under Monty Schinkel comparatively, or collectively, those two have preached for about two millennium. Both of them can bring it. Do you think you don't need it? Is it not possible, or is it not even fruitful, to block off about two hours on a Friday night, about five and a half on a Saturday, and then about two on a Sunday morning that would provide you with blessings for the rest of your life? Is it not possible just to 
sacrifice that amount of time for your spiritual growth, for His glory, and the resultant fruit that will come? Well, we'll have to get a babysitter. That's correct. Can you not give just part of one weekend for your spiritual growth? In the book, The Mortification of Sin, the Puritan John Owen said, if we neglect to make use of what we have received, God may justly withhold His hand from giving us more. His graces as well as His gifts are bestowed upon us to use and to exercise. So I ask you this morning, have you tripped and fallen? You're not really walking with God. The truth is your life is driven either by apathy or idolatry. If you've tripped and fallen, you're laying on the ground and you've become a stumbling block. And when many become apathetic and lax, the little ones in verse 2 see the example and they assume that this is normal Christianity. Should we go to that prayer meeting Sunday night? I don't think so. I don't think many people go. Let's go to the prayer meeting. No, nah, it's just the same people praying the same old things. Now, if you're stumbling this morning, if your self-assessment is, okay, that's me, there's good news. The Gospel does not condemn you. Did you hear that? The Gospel does not condemn you. Jesus came not to condemn but to save. So if you are becoming a stumbling block because you are tripping over pebbles, the gospel says to you, arise and walk. Very simply, repent. Gain the fruit of self-control. Prioritize according to eternity. And do the deeds as you did at first. And to quote John Owen again, he said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. He said, the vigor and power and comfort of our spiritual life depends upon the mortification of the deeds of the flesh. So there are stumbling blocks in this world. And verse 1 says, woe to the one through whom they come. Woe is not a curse. Woe is what's called a malediction. Modern day terms, plain terms, he's saying, man, it's going to be very bad for you. So bad that in verse 2, he said it would be better if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to stumble. You and I will be better off suffering a horrifying, mafia-style execution than we would be to cause a little one to stumble. The tension rises when we review the context. Verse 1 he is speaking to the disciples. Now it's true that the Pharisees were listening. And in Matthew 23, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. So the Pharisees were listening, and this applied to them, but the primary address is to the disciple. A Jesus follower can be the proximate cause in the fall of a little one. So that brings up a very important question. Who is a little one? And I can tell you that commentators have some different views on this. I want to give you two that are ever, pretty much uh, consensus on. Number one would be little children. Jesus loved little children. He said to enter heaven, you must, excuse me, you must become like a children, a child. Children, like a children. There's a fascinating passage in Matthew 21. In His righteous wrath, He overturned the tables of the money changers and those selling sacrifices, a violent act, and He drove them out of the temple. He had to do that physically. The very next verse says the blind and lame came to Him in the temple. And the verse after that says the children were shouting praises to Him in the temple. The children presumably saw Jesus throwing tables over and physically driving grown men out of the temple, yet they weren't afraid of Him. They were drawn to Him. You see, little children whose heart has not become hardened due to years of sin, 
who are more likely to be converted than anyone else, woe to the one who makes them stumble. Now here's some great news. The logical deduction from this and the logical deduction from other passages is there is great blessing to the one who ministers to children. And in our church, that would refer to those in the nursery, those who teach Sunday school, Awana, and children's church. So the little ones would be children. The second would be this. Those who are beginning to follow him. If we look at the context, listening to Jesus' sermons are newly converted tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners of every variety. And these are people who are new and they're trying to learn who this man is and how to follow him. Now as sinful creatures, all of us, we accidentally do and say that which is grievous to another. And we're going to learn later on that we need to ignore a lot of things. Secondly, there are lost people who will use almost anything that a Christian does or says as an excuse to avoid the Lord. But when we set those two things aside, we look and we notice that this warning should cause us to think in ways that we don't normally think. We have freedom in Christ. Are we using our freedom as a stumbling block? The words that we use, the way that we dress, what and how much you eat, where you go, what you post on social media, especially in times like during Tyson and Tongi, if I can bring that toxic phrase up, how you treat those weaker than you, how you conduct yourself away from this church Does any of that cause a stumbling block? In fact, how you conduct yourself in this church, how you participate or don't participate, little ones are noticing. Little ones who are looking to you, especially those of us who are older, who are looking to you and at you for an example, what kind of an example are you? There are other ways this forces us to think. This is one that I've seen quite often. When you're at a ball game and your kids are playing, are you screaming at the officials? When you're at work and you're mad, do you decide to just go off on someone as a regular habit? I mentioned alcohol a few months ago and got quite a response. When you drink alcohol, what message does that send to students and to children? You can disagree with me on that one if you want. But you do need to answer the question. What about the way we spend money? Two of the last three passages in Luke dealt with the misuse of riches. Just Friday, I read a story about immigrant pastors and their first impression of American churches. Did anybody see that? It was pretty widely spread. Several mentioned the individualism in our churches. Others mentioned the lack of evangelism. But one said this, it's hard to talk here about sin, salvation, heaven, and hell. Here when I've talked about our sinful nature, I've had church members leave. Others, the article said, pointed to being entertained by violent or sexual content, indulging in alcohol, drugs, or gambling, or adopting the American nonstop pursuit of more. What I'm asking you to do is to examine yourself along with me. But take heart here. Because so far, if you've been listening and you say, I need to examine myself, that means you have spiritual life. And as you examine yourself, take this caution. Sometimes self-examination can actually drive you further into a sin. Now here's an example. Let's say that you're apathetic, but you hate that you're apathetic. You hate that right now you don't care about Jesus and you don't care about His church. Okay, that's actually positive in a way because it's a sign that you have spiritual life, the fact that you hate it. But you don't know how to change. 
So you make an effort here or there, and that effort fails. It does nothing inside of you. You become further discouraged, and therefore you become more apathetic. The solution is not found in focusing on your apathy. The solution is found in filling yourself with biblical truth. Ponder heaven. And then think about hell. And that only the sinless Son of God could purchase redemption for you. He looked down through the ages and the Bible says He chose you. He rescued you from God's wrath. That gift is greater than all the money in the world, all the power, all the fame. And your inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, reserved in heaven for you. Rehearse those truths in your mind with the same intensity and frequency that you rehearse your apathy or that you rehearse your anger or your pain or your bitterness or your worldly plans. As a man thinketh, so is he. And when you begin to think on those truths, gratitude begins to grow. And it nurtures a renewed love for Him, which fuels a passion to live for Him. And you're no longer becoming a stumbling block before Christ, but you're becoming a stepping stone to Christ. You see, if we become a stumbling block, Jesus did not say that a giant millstone would be hung around your neck and you would be thrown into the bottom of the sea. He said that would be preferable to the consequence of making a little one stumble. And what bothers me about this passage is, that warning is open-ended. As bad as that kind of a death would be, he doesn't tell us what specifically would be worse. So be on your guard. This is so significant that Paul said, take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. And in Romans, he said, determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. Our culture tells us everything is between me and God. It's just me and God. It's not between just me and God. We are intertwined with one another in the same body of believers. Brothers and sisters, if you are a member of this church, you have agreed to try to bless one another, to encourage and strengthen and out do one another in showing honor. I've mentioned that many times in several weeks, in, in the past few weeks. And I would love, I would love for you, before you leave here this morning, to see who can outdo one another in showing honor this morning. How can you honor someone today before they leave? How can you put that in your mindset to do that every week? Your encouragement to someone, whether you know them or whether you need to introduce yourself to them, your encouragement may help them to not become a stumbling block. We all need encouragement. So there's the dreadful possibility of becoming a stumbling block. Number two, there's the exciting possibility of helping someone grow. Verse three, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Well, that doesn't sound like much fun, but this is a pathway to growth. As important as it, as it is not, excuse me, as important as it is not to be a stumbling block, it is also important to go to your brother or sister if he or she is in sin. This especially refers to a sin against you. If a fellow believer is sinning, we have a biblical mandate to rebuke him. And rebuke just means to admonish. Now, Bridging the gap here between the real and the biblical is very difficult. Very often, sadly, the person who is sinning is totally unapproachable. The ones, in my 21 years of ministry, the ones who needed rebuke the most are the ones who are unapproachable, and if you began to venture into their sin, there's a hair-trigger response of anger. But God's design is... This is God's design for our spiritual protection and correction. This is hard, but it can happen. In the past six months, I've received two emails correcting me. Both were sent by godly men. They were written in a godly way. Now, email is not usually the best way to do it because it can be very easily misconstrued, but these were done with great gentleness and grace. The first one, when I read it, I thought, wow, I immediately recognized my sin. The second one, I honestly didn't understand, but it was written in such a, 
a way that I thought, okay, I need to sleep on that. And in the morning, I got up and read it again and said, wow, he's exactly right. Both had the courage to give me gentle and wise correction. Now, the caution here is to make sure the rebuke is in order. I also, along with you, have received harsh, inaccurate, and inconsequential criticism. And you try to find some truth in those, but the truth is the wrapper is so unseemly, it's hard to look in the box very long. So if we go to one another, or I should say when we go, we go quietly, we go privately, or if appropriate with someone, we go with the absolute certainty that we aren't speck collecting while there's a log in our eye. We go being up to date in our own confession of sin. And as we go, we go as Christ deals with us, with gentleness and patience and a heart to restore. But to not go is to be unloving. It could be this is a reason why so many churches in America are apathetic. We've dropped our guard. God builds in churches this spiritual shield, but we've lowered it. And you say, but it's uncomfortable to go. A lack of discomfort is probably a disqualification to go. But God gives us the grace to go. And when we go, Galatians 6 says, we go each one looking to yourself. So I want to ask you this question, and believe me, this is a relevant question. Ask yourself deep down in your heart, are you willing to receive correction? Here's a different question. Why does God put importance on this? Well, let me quote John Owen one more time. He said, in the ordinary relationship with God... The vigor and comfort of our spiritual lives depends much on our mortification of sin. Every mortified sin will certainly do two things. Excuse me. Every unmortified sin will certainly do two things. Number one, it will weaken the soul and deprive it of its vigor, or it will darken the soul and deprive it of its comfort and peace. Listen. That's so good, I want to say it again. Every unmortified sin will either weaken the soul and deprive it of its vigor, its energy, or it will darken the soul and deprive it of its comfort and peace. Now, I want to compliment you on this. I have no concerns about preaching this in this church because I believe that you're mature enough to avoid speck hunting wise enough when the deliverer rebuke, and discerning enough to separate sin from personal preference. And I also trust that as we read this passage and preach about it, you also will think about receiving correction as much as giving it. In both directions, we stay on our guard. So there's the dreadful possibility of making one stumble. There is the exciting possibility of helping someone grow, there's the divine capacity to forgive one another. As important as it is not to be a stumbling block, it is also important not to take offense when others sin against us. Verse 3, if he repents, forgive him. That if presents a problem. Looks like we've got an out clause, doesn't it? If he repents, well, he didn't repent, so I'm not going to forgive him. But that's not what Jesus means. Scripture interprets Scripture. There are numerous other passages about our responsibility to forgive regardless of what the offender does or doesn't do. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. So we're instructed to forgive even if no apology is given. Not everyone will repent, but if someone sins against you and their repentance is real, it is your responsibility to truly forgive, and true forgiveness means you don't bring it up again. Grudges cannot be held. You don't rehearse and rehash the past. If you stop rehearsing your hurts, they will fade. And if you do not forgive, 
The danger is that you become bitter and cynical and unapproachable. And we never sin in a vacuum. So when even a tiny bit of bitterness takes root, our bitterness hurts one another. But when we forgive, our forgiveness blesses one another. In the 70s, there was an amazing revival that happened in all places, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Thousands of people were saved. A seminary was birthed from it. And it started in a church smaller than ours. During a worship service, a woman was listening to a sermon and thought, I have been praying for revival in Canada, but I hate the pastor's wife. And she admitted that she had been mistreating her. So she went to her, admitted her sin, apologized for the things that she had done, and made it right with her. Now, immediately after that, revival broke out. Now, please hear me. I don't know whether that was causation or correlation. Only God knows. But that church could only seat 300 people. Soon they needed room for 700. And the revival spread through Canada, and you can Google that and read about it yourself. Now, we need to say this. God is sovereign. Revival is not formulaic. If we do A and B and C, that does not mean that God will send a revival. God sovereignly sends revival. God sovereignly sends judgment. But forgiveness pleases God. Look at verse 4. If he sins against you seven times in a day and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Seven times seven is, of course, metaphorical. It means you always forgive. In this day and age, we need to mention what that does not mean. That does not mean that you set yourself up for more abuse. Please hear me. There are situations where you need to create distance. And if you are in a situation right now where you are being physically or sexually abused, call the police 10 times out of 10. Now, the common objection is if it is an abused spouse, The common objection is, if I call the police, my spouse might lose their job. Actually, they will. But you have to deal with the present and let God take care of tomorrow. You say, that's easy for you to say. Friend, that's the only solution. Forgiveness does not ever mean that you allow yourself to be abused or someone else to be abused. But what if something has happened to you? And I know that it has. What if something has happened to you and you right now are saying, you know what, I can't forgive. Okay, to a certain extent, you're right. The Holy Spirit inside of you will get you there. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is an action. And it is 100% my responsibility to forgive and never to let bitterness grow in my heart. And forgiveness is not always going to be perfect. Sometimes you think you've forgiven and that thing comes back. J.C. Ryle said, The presence of the Spirit in the heart will always be known by the fruits which He causes to bring forth. The man who has not learned to bear and forbear, to put up with much and overlook much, is not born of the Spirit. Now, how can you forgive someone who has wronged you? Some of you have heard me say this. I don't want to be formulaic. God is not formulaic any more in forgiveness than He is revival or anything else. This is my personal experience. We're told to pray for those people. So I just pray. And God knows what you're thinking. So I just pray, Lord, Your Word says I must forgive this person. I have to confess to my shame, but I confess I hate this person. And I confess that as sin. And I pray that you would take that evil from my heart. And even though you know I don't really mean it, I pray that you would bless that person in every way. Bless him or her physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, maritally, financially. I pray you'd pour out your blessings on his or her life. And I pray that you would forgive the unforgiveness that is in my dark heart. That's a pretty honest prayer. But you pray that be transparent with God. Don't rehearse the hurt. And it is amazing how the power of God will bring forgiveness into your life. We're all in process. 
And if you are in a situation right now where something has happened or something is happening and you cannot change it and your enemy is not going to repent, there comes a point where you must say to God, God, if you can somehow get great glory for yourself through this, then I surrender myself to you as the one who can do with my life as you want. But help me to forgive. Now there's great news here. In our quest to remember, or excuse me, in our quest to forgive, remember that not only is Jesus speaking, he's actually in verse 4. As our brother, as the Bible calls him, we sin against him. How often do we make that right? Or we might mutter the meaning was, forgive me where I have failed you, bromide. But we sin against him countless times in a day. He goes well beyond seven times seven, forgiving each one of us. And because of the gospel, we know that His forgiveness possesses two characteristics that our forgiveness lacks. His forgiveness is permanent, and His forgiveness is perfect. So this exhorts us, even if we must rebuke someone to be gracious to others as Christ is gracious to us. Because He forgives us Seven times seven times seven times seven cubed to the 38th millionth power. I'm not a math person. But his forgiveness is infinite, everlasting, and complete. Now, everything we talked about is hard. So look at verse 5. The disciples thought so too. And they said, increase our faith. Now, we often notice the disciples failing, so don't miss this one. They didn't ask for the courage to give correction. They didn't ask for the humility to receive correction. They didn't ask for the power to forgive. They didn't ask, Lord, keep me from being a stumbling block. They asked for what is necessary to do the impossible, faith. They got it right. Hypothetical situation. You've been defrauded of a large amount of money. Lord, I can't forgive that person. They hurt me badly. They cost me tens of thousands of dollars that I will never recoup. I need that money. My family could use that money. And that person has no remorse, no conviction. He actually justifies what he did. I, I can't forgive him. But you owe Jesus a far greater debt and you daily defraud him. But by faith. He took your sin and put it under the cross. He took the wrath of God for your daily defraudment. In fact, all of your sins are atoned for. And instead of hell, you will live in eternal bliss. Now when we look at it from that standpoint, can we in good conscience not forgive the one who defrauded us with the knowledge that we defraud Jesus of much more? By faith, you can forgive. And the example for all of this is Jesus. What was done to him was the most wicked act ever conceived. And everyone was in on it. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Romans, Pilate, Judas, Caiaphas, Anaphas, you and me. And the Romans flogged him, and the Jews mocked him, and the disciples abandoned him, and he was naked nailed to a cross. What was his response? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So by faith, we trust that He will give us that eternal perspective to forgive. Increase our faith. You know, that was a good response, but don't misunderstand. It really wasn't the best response because more faith is not what's needed. The object of our faith is more important than the amount of our faith. The amount of our faith is subjective. Right now, how much faith do you have on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 to 100? What is it? The amount is subjective, but the object of our faith is very objective. It is the resurrected Christ who lives and rules and reigns and forgives our sins today. So look at Jesus' response. 
He said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, the Lord said, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. A mulberry tree was considered by the Jews to be unmovable. Jesus said even the smallest amount of faith will move one. Now, this passage has been grossly distorted. It's not a matter of just a little faith will move the unmovable in your life. And that mulberry tree of fear or worry, that mulberry tree that stands in the way of that which you desire, it'll be cast out of the way with just a little faith. That's not what it means. (laughs) The ability to do everything that Jesus has commanded is not found in having more faith. It is found in possessing true faith, faith in Jesus, even if it's small. And we see the gospel right here again. Because who can move a mulberry tree? Jesus takes that immovable mulberry tree of sin out of our way and he casts it. Notice it says he cast it into the sea. The sea is a metaphor for chaos and the ominous and the dark in the Bible. In the book of the Revelation, the beast emerges from the sea. Jesus takes that immovable sin and casts it into the sea. And Revelation 21 says, in the new heaven there is no longer any sea. That sin that you commit, it's all. if, if you're believing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's gone. Your record is clear. You're innocent, you're undefiled. The righteousness of Christ has been given to you. When you walk out of here today, the righteousness of Christ has been given to you. Now, if you've never trusted Jesus to remove your sin and cast it away forever, you can believe Him by faith right now. You acknowledge your sin You desire to repent of sin and you surrender yourself by faith to Jesus as Lord and King. You can do that right where you sit right now. And tell one of us, Ryan, myself, or someone, tell us after the service so we can help you take the next steps. If you would like to talk to someone about salvation or baptism, I'd love to have that conversation. So would Ryan. Check the card on the back of your worship attendance slip and we'll be in touch.